and welcome to GP Notebook TV. I'm Dr Roger Henderson and I'm a GP in the south of Scotland. Today I want to be talking about the ADA ESD consensus report on type 2 diabetes in adults which came out in autumn 2022 in the Diabetes Care Journal. The American Diabetes Association and the European Association for the Study of Diabetes have previously put out this report in 2018, updated in 2019. So this is an update since those last reports were published. It goes into a great deal of detail and I thought it might be helpful if I give you what I would say are my top 10 points that I've taken from this report and they're designed to be used with our existing guidelines such as NICE and SIGN that we use in our day-to-day -day help with our patients with type 2 diabetes in our surgeries. So this 2022 update really focuses on patient-centered care and weight loss as the key driving principles for this new update. So in no particular order, the top 10 that I would sort of look at is that we should be individualizing dietary patterns for each of our type 2 diabetes patients. And this is in part to help achieve weight reduction, of which I'm going to touch on later. There is obviously no silver bullet regarding weight loss and dietary patterns, and the report does accept this. But it does behove us to speak with each of our patients with type 2 diabetes as to their dietary habits and try and improve them wherever possible. The second point is that we have to think about 24-hour behaviour in type 2 diabetes. And the report has come up with five S's. These are steps, sweating, sitting, strength and sleep. For steps, the report suggests that our patients should be stepping more than 500 extra steps compared to what they are currently doing because this is associated with a definite reduction in long-term morbidity. For sweating, they should be doing exercise that makes them warm or even sweat. And as part of that, they should be reducing the amount of time they are sitting. Again with exercise, Strengthening exercises means basically using resistance treatments, you know, weight redu uh, weights, for example, but they do not have to be lifting heavy weights to do strengthening exercises that will benefit them. And for sleep, they should be looking to sleep at least six or seven hours a day, if at all possible. The third point I'd mention is the actual choice of treatment that we are using. If you have a patient with type 2 diabetes who is at increased risk of coronary heart disease, heart failure or chronic kidney disease, we should now be considering using SGL2 inhibitors and GLP-1 RAs independent of whether they are taking metformin and what their HbA1c level is. And this is a new approach compared to several years ago. Again, looking at um, treatment, and this is point four, if you have a patient who may be on the point of starting insulin, consider using a GLP-1 RA now if not contraindicated. This can reduce the injection burden as well as any risk of hypoglycemic episodes. So the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists we should now be looking to use pre-insulin if at all possible. The fifth point, as always, and I'm sure you know all this anyway, is that we should be addressing social determinants of health in all our patients with type 2 diabetes. We know that those social health determinants can have a real impact on their long-term survival with type 2 diabetes. We're probably all doing it anyway, but it's useful to be reminded of that. The sixth point is that we should be aware of cognitive decline in our older patients with type 2 diabetes. And as a consequence of this, perhaps increase the use of our screening tools, such as mini mental health assessments, 
in our type 2 diabetes consultations. I've certainly started doing that more and it is, it is surprising how much cognitive impairment you find when you start looking for it in our type 2 older diabetes patients. The seventh point is if you have a patient with type 2 diabetes who has non-alcoholic steatorrhea, hepatitis, or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, then consider using pioglitazone as a treatment for them. It does appear to have a significant impact in those patients with those particular liver conditions. The eighth point concerns therapeutic inertia. This is a really important point. What we don't want to be doing is having patients who are just on maintenance treatment for their diabetes, therapeutic inertia if you will, but whose diabetes is progressively getting away from them quite steadily. So if you have a younger patient with type 2 diabetes, or if you have a patient whose HbA1c is greater than 70, then consider combination treatment sooner rather than later in those patients. This is really obviously to improve their glycemic control. Weight loss is absolutely key in this report. And the reason is that the study suggests that if you can lose 5 to 10% of your body weight as someone with type 2 diabetes, you can definitely improve your metabolic status simply by doing that. And if you are able to go all the way and lose 10 to 15% of weight, then you can actually induce remission in type 2 diabetes. It is the holy grail I know for many of us when we're talking to our patients with type 2 diabetes, many of whom can find it very hard to lose weight. But the rewards are there and this consensus report now puts those out in black and white. And finally, if you have a patient who is on insulin, then we should now be considering using continuous glucose monitoring in all those patients. The technology is now at a point where that can be extremely helpful for those patients on long-term insulin, provided they have the correct education in using continuous glucose monitoring equipment. So those top 10 tips from this ADA ESD consensus statement from this year, I do hope you found those helpful in terms of not only remembering what we should be doing with our type 2 diabetes patients, but also using them in our clinical practices when that patient is in front of us. I hope that you'd have found this useful and that you'd join us for the next episode of GP Notebook TV.